This is Think Energy, the podcast that helps you better understand the fast-changing world of energy through conversations with game changers, industry leaders, and influencers. So join me, Dan Sege, as I explore both traditional and unconventional facets of the energy industry. Bonjour les amis, and welcome back. Our guest today is a distinguished personality with an extensive and impressive career in sports, politics, and the energy sector. Jim Durrell, former mayor of Ottawa and chair of the board at Hydro Ottawa, attended Acadia University at the age of 17, where he was the quarterback and co-captain of the Acadia Axman football team. He learned valuable lessons during this experience, which helped shape his future career. He has a passion for sports and a commitment to bringing world-class sporting events to Ottawa, including the 1988 Grey Cup game and a AAA baseball franchise to the city. Jim served as the president of the Ottawa Senators and has been inducted in the Ottawa Sports Hall of Fame as a builder. We will talk to Jim about how these achievements prepared him for his role as a mayor and the many board positions he has held, including his current role as chair of Hydro Ottawa. Jim will share with us the biggest changes he has seen in the electricity sector since he joined the board in 2012 and his vision for Ottawa's energy future. So. Here is today's big question for Jim. What are the greatest challenges and opportunities that Ottawa residents face in moving towards net zero? Jim, welcome to the show. I understand you went to Acadia University in Nova Scotia at the tender age of 17. While there, you were the quarterback and co-captain of the Acadia Axman football team. What are some of the valuable lessons that this experience taught you? I'd have to say that, uh, and, and it's a, a generalization about football, unlike a lot of other sports. In basketball, you can be an unbelievable player and carry your whole team and do something. In football, it's the very much a team effort. If your offensive line isn't playing well, you get massacred as a quarterback. You can't pass. You, your running backs are hit. So, and and it uh, unlike other sports as well, you can't really talk to the referees. If you say so much as boo to them the wrong way, your entire team is penalized. So it was a, it was a wonderful lesson in teamwork, in understanding the value of teamwork, and at the same time recognizing that you can within the rules of the game. There's some leeway, but it's not just about you. It's clear to say that you have a love for sports and your commitment to bringing world-class sporting events to Ottawa is unsurpassed. I mean, you served as president of the Ottawa Senators. You secured the 1988 Grey Cup game for Ottawa. You delivered a AAA baseball franchise to the city. On top of this, you have served as a governor for Canada's Sports Hall of Fame and have been inducted as a builder in the Ottawa Sports Hall of Fame. So I have to ask you this, how did these achievements prepare you for your role as a mayor and for many board positions that you have held through the years, including serving as chair for Hydro Ottawa? Sport is, uh, I, I include sport in the entertainment world. So when I look at the four cornerstones of a great city. And I believe Ottawa is a great city. One is education, one is healthcare, one is your economy, and the fourth one is, and in no particular order, is sports and entertainment. And it's like a chair. And when you've got the four legs of the chair all sitting there, then you've got the makings of a great chair, okay? And the bottom line is that uh, young people today the world is far bigger than sitting in your office working all day, and I've done that for my entire life. But the world is 
people need to be entertained. There's a life outside the office. There's a life that you can enjoy with friends, with family. And sport does that. And, uh, you know, as a young man growing up in Montreal, Jean Beliveau was my hero, the Canadians. I, I love that. And, and, and young people have to have these heroes. One of the issues that I always found was when you came to Ottawa, uh, certainly before we brought the NHL here, is that all our heroes were from other cities. Well, now it's not the case. So you can have a CFL hero, you can have an NHL hero. And these things are very important to me uh, for young men and women that they have models to look up to and grow. Okay, cool. Um, now, what were some of the key learnings as a mayor that you were able to transfer to your role at Hydro Ottawa? And what were some of the key differences? You know, when you're mayor of uh, uh, the capital city of Canada, uh, it was uh, it's a job that no matter how many years you spend training, it's a, a whole different world. And you recognize, I guess I'll go back and just say, in our personal lives, we choose our friends. We choose what we want to do and when we want to do it. When you're mayor, you see the underbelly of a city. You see the great, you see the challenges, you see the toughness, and it all gets thrown on you on a daily basis. And uh, um, and I don't mean that negatively. I mean it from a learning perspective because you walk out of that job with a far bigger view and vision of of how the world really, really works. And uh, so when I came to Hydro, it was, it's interesting because we're very much a private company, but we're even more a public company. And the expectations of the public at large and our shareholder, which is city council. Now, I'm very fortunate having spent all the years that I did at the city. I understand how council works and I understand what's important to the individual councillors and, and the mayor. And so that has been an asset for me to uh, be able to move through those minefields and uh, we'll call them whatever you want. But uh, the bigger picture is I never forgot how important our customers were. And our customers were the citizens of Ottawa. And that's our raison d'etre. That's why we're here. Jim, um, you have served on the Hydro Ottawa board since July 2012. What is the biggest change you've seen in Hydro Ottawa since? Well, that's a good question. And when I became chairman, Hydro Ottawa was a very highly, highly regulated business. And by a regulated business, we, we just mailed out the bills, people paid the bills, and we provided energy to their homes. As time has gone on, and we see this all everywhere, uh, fridges, stoves, air, everything is much, much more efficient. So when you look at the consumption level per house and per business, it's dropped substantially. Now, people would argue, then why are my hydro rates going up? It's a regulated business and we're basically controlled by the province. It's really the reality of life. To succeed and grow then, we had to move into other fields. So, in 2012, 95% of our net income basically came from the regulated business. Today, it's 67%. And that change, that movement away uh, has been largely through green energy. And, and there are things that we can control in our future. We're the boss. And uh, it allows us, when I look at shoddy air, you know, uh, the falls and the energy, we're the largest municipally owned run of the water in, in Ontario right now. That's the biggest change, that we've really gravitated from a sterile, old regulated business to an exciting, expanding, growing, and financially successful business. Okay, now, I know you love a challenge. So what project or moment during your tenure as board chair for Hydro Ottawa do you consider to have been the most challenging? 
The biggest thing I would say is, and it gets a little complicated, so I'll try and keep it in at a high level. We pay every year a dividend to the city. They're our shareholder. They expect a dividend. We always borrowed money, and it's a, I won't get into financial structures because it's a strange animal created by the province, but we were borrowing money to pay the city a dividend, which just drove us further and further in debt all the time. And our free cash flow, which is what you should pay dividends out, was diminished or non-existent. By changing to an unregulated business, which is what we're doing now, the unregulated business doesn't pay the dividend. We made that fundamental governance change. So we pay a dividend out of Hydro Ottawa Limited, but all our other Portage Power on, in Vary, all of our other businesses, we keep that cash and those profits. So it basically long term means that we won't be borrowing to pay dividends to the city. It was the largest fundamental change that we made. If you could take out your crystal ball and forecast the future, what do you see in Ottawa's energy future? For all of the talk that goes on about climate change and efficiencies, very little, frankly, is ever done. I mean, solar has just barely scratched the surface here. Uh, wind is, you know, even less so and only in certain areas. So there are, we've got an enormous number of buildings, federal and municipal, that are older buildings, very poorly constructed for today's modern energy desires. And there has to be a big infrastructure. You can talk all day long about cars and efficiencies there. And the hidden energy that's used by all of these older infrastructures is staggering. And nobody talks about it, like quite frankly. So they spend their time worrying about a, uh, an electric vehicle. And those are largely highly visible. And it's not that they're not important. The fact of the matter is there's an enormous other number of areas that have to be changed. And those changes cost money. I look at the amount of money they created for Stellantis and for this plant in, in, uh, in St. Thomas as well. And, you know, for Volkswagen, and those are all lovely things. And uh, But when I, I look at money that could really be reinvested properly and, and have a profound impact in our city, it's fixing that infrastructure. It really is. What, in your opinion, are some of the greatest challenges that we are facing as a community moving toward a net zero economy? It's understanding what is net zero. It's now thrown around so casually and, and everybody jumps right away and focuses on electric vehicles. Well, that's how we're going to do it. And they focus on, uh, we're going to do more wind and solar. The counterbalance is there's a huge movement out there to cancel natural gas, which is quite frankly, still highly energy efficient. And you have to as you gravitate to net zero, it has to be financially affordable for people. It's fine for elites and it's fine for people who've got lots of money to say we, we're all going to do this. There's a staggering number of people who live in this city that live hand to mouth and they need energy just like the elites need energy. And I use that word and I, and I it sounds in such a disparaging way, but they make most of the decisions. Uh, so... As you move to net zero, you have to do it in an affordable, practical way. The city council passed a motion to cancel natural gas. Do you know what that would, imagine trying to go to your house now, you have no natural gas and you're going to have electricity. You know, instead of paying a couple of hundred bucks a month, you're going to be paying thousands. Well, people can't afford that. This is just you know, it's, it's, it's lovely, it's, but it's quite frankly, nonsense. At some point in time, it's a nice thing to do. My granddaughter is your very atypical 16-year-old idealist. She's smart, engaged. I just adore her. And she's all on climate all the time. Grandpa, you got and this and that. And as I always said to her, your grandpa totally agrees with you, dear. It's just that you have to move there in a responsible fashion. And if you don't, you're going to hurt a tremendous number of people in the process. 
So the bottom line for me is most of these net zero goals are overly ambitious. There's no real plan to do them. You, you know, whether it's federally, provincially, everybody just is talking about it. And the goals are admirable, but it's got to be a, a, a goal that is achievable. I, I've, for how many years now have I watched the federal government say, you know, we're going to cut our carbon emissions and every year they go up. What the hell's the use of all this planning or whatever they call it? And nobody says anything about it. You're going to kill me, but I've got a follow-up question here. Now, I'll flip that question. What, in your opinion, Jim, are the greatest opportunities that we have as a community in moving toward achieving net zero? People understanding what net zero is. You know, really understanding and what they have to do themselves to try and get there. It's only a collective buying in, in my estimation, by the public at large, that's really ever going to move this. I'll go back to electric vehicles. There aren't enough charging stations around anywhere to handle. And everybody is, oh yeah, in, te- in, in five years, it'll be only electric vehicles. No, there won't. In 10 years, well, there won't. no, there won't. I'm not even sure in 15 years because the infrastructure isn't there to support it. So there's something that I think can really happen and happen properly. We're trying to gravitate to all of our vehicles being electric here at Hydro Ottawa. We can't get the vehicles. Oh, so it's a lovely goal, but they're not building them. And so, This is the reality, and if people have to really understand, and it's not the prime minister going out with some dribble or drabble and saying these are all the things of the minister of the environment. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but the bottom line is it's all window dressing. There's nothing really honestly substantive there that affects you and me on a daily basis. We pay more on a carbon tax, and I got a check the other day. I didn't even know what I got the check for, and I find out it was some reimbursement. Well, this is all window dressing. There's more cars on the road today than there ever was, and all it does is hurt the little guy who can't afford this stuff. You know, so the opportunities are enormous. They're far-reaching, uh, but it, they can only be achieved when people understand it. In its simplest equation, it's. I want to lose 30 pounds by next year. Okay, well, that's a wonderful thing. Well, how are you going to do it? Well, these are the things I'm going to do. Okay, so in next month, how many will you, what what will you have lost? Well, if I do all this, I should have lost four pounds and you move it through and there's your 30. I don't see any of that happening, frankly. So there's a real opportunities there. It's moving again from window dressing to substantive action. That's meaningful. You've had a very storied and accomplished life, Jim. So which singular achievement in this wonderful life so far are you most proud of? Well, leaving your family out because I think that's unnatural. I would have to say that uh, uh, receiving the Order of Canada, which is the highest honor a civilian or a citizen can get to be recognized by your country. And uh, uh, I, I still, I, I have my snowflake on my jacket as we speak here today. Um, that was something going to Rideau Hall and having the Governor General talk about your accomplishments. And uh, it, it was something that has left a lasting impression. It keeps you enormously humble. And I hope... Uh, It'll have a great impact on my grandchildren and how they know they can make this country a better place. What is the one singular thing, in your opinion, that Ottawa residents most need to know about the work we do at Hydro Ottawa that they may not already know? Our reliability, and every every single month we look at two things— uh, the uh, acronyms are SADI and SAFETY, but it's the number of outages and the frequency of time. We are best in class and have been for a number of years compared to other comparable 
energy utilities. And we take hydro for granted. Uh, every day we just wake up and flick a light and you, you just, you, then you go and you start, your, you open your fridge and you, all of these things are just, we don't even give a second thought to them except when they don't work all of a sudden. And then it's like, well, what the hell's going on here? Why is this off? And hydro is probably not because I'm chairman, because it won't be for long. It's the best value for money in all of the bills that we pay. It really is. I mean, when I think of the lifestyle that it provides citizens on a day-to-day basis for what you pay, it's a great deal. And finally, sir, after your retirement as board chair in June, where are we next likely to see Jim Durrell? On the golf course at Augusta or celebrating with a Stanley Cup over your shoulders? (laughs) <laughs> oh, uh, boy, I'll tell you, I thought we were going to win the cup. Uh, had we had goaltending, we would have won it back in uh, in, uh, in 08. But, um, you know, uh, I've always been active. It keeps me young mentally. And uh, so I, 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 and I've been very blessed. I have a great group of friends who are equally active. So we play tennis, we play golf. And... Uh, my, I'll, I'll always care about the community. I mentor a number of young people. I'll continue to do that. I find that very personally fulfilling to pay it forward with young people. So uh, it'll be a lot of that. I, you know, frankly, with the committees and all of the boards I've chaired, uh, I'm coming up 77. Uh, it's time, uh, the torch is being passed. My wife always says, you're going to go crazy. No, I won't. Uh, Because I've, in my life, built a a tremendous group of friends and associates, most of whom have been very accomplished. And we have discussion groups and we talk about things. So mentally, I stay challenged. Physically, I stay challenged. And uh, I'm blessed to have a great family and I just love life. Lastly, we Always end our interviews with some rapid-fire questions. Are you ready? Sure. Okay, sir. What are you reading right now? I just finished the book. Uh, It was the prequel to Pillars of the Earth. So it was very good. I'm also a big John Grissom fan, I have to say, largely because he does really fascinating stories, but there's always history lessons. He's like Leon Uris used to be, you know, uh, when he was writing, that you had lots of factual history and around it, they put in the adventure in the story. The next one is always interesting. What would you name your boat if you had one, or maybe you do have one? I have one and I call it the first lady. Who is someone that you truly admire? I admire so many people. Uh, I'm trying to move away out of, out of family. I know it's a rapid fire question. So I'm, I know so many accomplished people and I admire. I don't know if there's any one person in particular that I would pick out of, you know, other than within family, honestly. Okay. What is the closest thing to real magic that you've witnessed? The birth of a child. What has been the biggest challenge to you personally since the pandemic began? I was staying uh, socially active. I'm a, I'm a, a very social animal, and uh, so I refused to have the pandemic control my life. I got all my shots when I should get them. I followed the rules, but I stayed fairly socially active. Now, we've all been guilty of watching a lot more Netflix and TV lately. What's your favorite movie or show right now? Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, the Bridgerton. I enjoyed Succession. Uh, I'm into Yellowstone now. I, uh, but frankly, I, I, I hardly, if it's not a sporting event that I'm interested in, I, I watch very little TV. I just find TV today is not very good. And I'm busy. You know, I'll watch a movie every now and again, but it doesn't control my life. Lastly, Jim, what's exciting you? about the energy sector right now? Not a lot. <laughs> I hate to say this because I'm, 
I'm a glass half full guy. Um, when I look at the competency of our senior management, and I'm going to take that question internally. When I see the men and women that are running Hydro Ottawa today, that makes me excited. It gives me confidence. And it's not BS. though. Our executive team is a highly competent group of men and women who really give a damn and I think do an extremely good job. Well, this is it. We've reached the end of another episode of the Think Energy Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you had a lot of fun. Pleasure. I enjoyed it. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Think Energy Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening. And to find out more about today's guest or previous episodes, visit thinkenergypodcast.com. I hope you'll join us again next time as we spark even more conversations about the energy of tomorrow.